described me a few months ago when we met in New York, the moment of these six weeks in this house with the smell and this closeness to these people, you became like a family. Also Jerry was part of it, but he's, we can't see him now, but it was two of you, two of them, and it is like a family, six weeks in this place. What is happening there? Uh, they're, they're living their lives exactly the way they were without us. Only, only more motivated, perhaps, to expose themselves because there's a camera there. The, the camera, if it's properly used, doesn't have to change things. It already can bring out more what's gone, going on. When we would arrive at the house each day, it was too smelly to stay there overnight. But when we arrive at the house to film, uh, we'd get out of the car and spray ourselves so we wouldn't be bitten by fleas. Uh, and when we were doing that, we were behind the bushes and they couldn't see us, so we could hear them. And it was exactly the same kind of conversations that we later on got on film. So let's see the other conversation, okay, Kati? No, no, let's do the on the veranda, the, the conversation between Edith and Billy when they try to write a check. Oh, yeah. let's look at the, okay, let's see the other clip. Of. Uh, is it a homosexual in the room? <laughs> because it would be nice to, to hear that person's reaction to the film and, and I think to disclose the idea that I just made put, put forth. Uh, it's about time that we abandon the Hollywood necessity to express conflict through killing, through war, and not to express some kind of happiness that achieved through a peaceful avoidance of, of conflict. Uh, these, these two women are in battle with one another, but I, to my mind, there's more love than, than uh, disagreement. Uh, so it's a good example of, for us to, to even follow in an odd way. Uh, this, in a way, you describe here a new family, a new way of living. It's a new family. They live for 20 years in the same house. Only two of them share the life. And you took a very, very simple thing, like writing a check, <laughs> and it reflects the whole world uh, through this scene, which is so wonderful by the way you do it. And also, again, it's reflect for me um, like a new way of family that now is more and more relevant because many people ask, how to live in this world. Uh, I, I venture to say that one thing that's so bold and, uh, and new about this film is that uh, I say I would say that most documentary filmmakers, as good as they are, um, fail to get that close to what's really going on. And uh, they don't have the Courage, the, the stamina to wait, to wait, to wait for things happening. Have that, have that uh, confidence uh, that they're going to have a film. So we have to let things happen. A famous uh, American film director came up with the statement that in a fiction film, the director is God. In a non-fiction film, God is the director. So let's call it God or call it reality. You don't have to deal with what's going on. And you end up with something that is totally truthful, with good editing, good camera work, uh, unprejudiced, uh, with the, the, the opportunity, this very rare opportunity, for the person watching on the, the movie on the screen to identify with, to 
really know what's going on uh, and have a better understanding of the human condition. There are a couple of words that keep coming up when I talk about documentary as practiced by my brother, myself, and by others nowadays too. And that is experience is the word, is one of the words. We're trying to capture experience of the person having that experience in the film. What a precious, wonderful opportunity to really get to know what's going on. Uh, uh, another thing that happens is that the people in the film become humanized. Uh, you, may, you may pick up the newspaper and read all about a war, but very rarely do you, or can you really get in a, in a journalistic approach, which is something that's written, I suppose, that same day in the happening, uh, close to the happening, but not as close as what the viewer can get in actually being there and picking up everything that the camera picks up. Uh, so there's the experience and there's the uh, the fact that there's no control over what's taking place. Sure, the camera person is, is only a human being and they even make mistakes, but, but uh, you have the opportunity to be on common ground. It's different, your point of view may be from the people on the screen. Uh, you are connected with a fellow human being in a way that almost be that person for that time. Once he told me that in every film of you and your brother, there is a connection to your early childhood. I think that, and this may apply to you as filmmakers, uh, I, think it, I think at some point, maybe even it's only after you've made the film, you realize that there's an important part of your childhood somehow is expressed in, in maybe a diff completely different way, but, but it's a reflection of what you experienced as, as a youngster. And when you realize that, that that's in the background of what's happening, then uh, you know that you've done very well. You've, 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 you've connected with something that's very important to you find exactly that kind of thing, uh, something that somebody else, having shot that film, film wouldn't, wouldn't have connected with. Maybe they would find something of their own background in it, too. That's great. And how, how it's connected with Grey Garden? Where is Grey Garden in this? Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I haven't thought about that. <laughs> My, my brother thought that Mrs. Beale was like my mother, and uh, I never really felt that way. Uh, it may come to me as we talk some more. Well, why, why, why did he think like that? What did he say in, 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 in her that reminded him of your mother? Well, my mother was a very, very, very strong person. Uh, not that she posed her will on us, but we, we learned so much about how to develop as, as human beings from her. And, and even though as, as children we were never making movies, she helped us in, in that she said that uh, there's good in everybody. And that, that, that became a principle by which we made our films, looking for the good uh, and, fi and finding that. And where, where something bad was taking place, we'd have to use our discretion as to whether we should include it or not. Uh, something bad might not be hurtful. It might not uh, exercise.
exercise some sort of effect on the vulnerability. But, uh, so we might include it. But uh, you have to be very discreet. And uh, fortunately, there were so many good things taking place in Great Gardens, good things by the standards of these two women, that uh, we just loved it. When the film was shown to them, they were the first to see it. Edie stood up and said, the Maisels have created a classic. <laughs> and uh, if we had any doubts about their love or other reaction to the film, uh, we certainly, no doubt, learned that uh, he had done the right thing. You say, take a political point of view to, to, uh, to persuade people one way or another. Uh, politics might very well come out in the, in the film. Uh, uh, a criticism uh, or, or a love for, for capitalism or communism, or it, it may be enhanced by, by whatever the person sees. And you have no control over the viewer's mind and what that viewer takes out of the film. But uh, uh, it, it, it does give a very full harvest of ideas of, of such for which to tangle with. Uh, Albert, you say that Grey Gardens, in a way, it's, for David, it was like filming your mother. You told me that filming salesmen is like filming your father. Yes. Could you tell about it? Yes. Uh, my father was a very talented uh, musician. He uh, played in the high school orchestra, he played the cornet. And uh, I have his cornet. He passed away, but I have his cornet. And every time I look at it, I think, oh, that's my father playing it. Because my, my father never played it in my presence. Because, as I understood later on, his, his brothers, he had three brothers, and they all played together with him. And when one of them died, he just didn't have the heart to play anymore. So he never became a musician. And being brought up amongst the Irish, who, who yearned to become civil, civil employees, worked for the police department or the fire department uh, or the post office, my father became a postal clerk. Unfortunate in a way, but it, because it was really the wrong job for him. And uh, the four salesmen were selling something which they really didn't want to sell at a price that was really beyond their customers. So they hated their work, but they had no other profession. They had no profession and not, nothing else to do from which to make some money. And uh, it was an opportunity to, to use uh, some sort of talent for persuasion, but they hated what they were doing. And uh, I never have a, had a discussion about it with my father, but I think if we would, uh, I would have discovered that he didn't like his work. Uh, and, uh, but I appreciate uh, from other conversations with him and getting to know him, appreciated him as a very, very good father. I can't explain it. <laughs> I'm sure I've made mistakes that way, but in general, I'm, I'm right, on, right, at, right at the right place at the right time. Uh, I'm, I'm all eyes and ears. Uh, I'm very lucky to have had a uh, an imperfect childhood where I listened much, much more than I spoke. In fact, I was almost totally silent for many years until I was in my 20s and teaching psychology, so I had to talk all the time and listen. And as a teacher, I was one of the best listeners. As a camera person, I'm one of the best listeners. Uh, so things happen on their own. Especially because of that relationship 
of empathy uh, so people feel comfortable. And as, as you get into more filming of that person in those 10 or 20 minutes, whatever it is, that relationship gets even better and better and better. So that uh, whereas the very first moment I was thinking as I, as I watched this and listened to it, did, did you get that humorous moment where he thought that she was Irish, but that she was Polish, and he says, and, and this rings in my mind every day, almost the rest of my life, uh, Poles are good people. <laughs> so anytime something comes up where somebody is an Israeli, Israelis are good people. Mara's a good people. <laughs> uh, and one more point I'd like to make, too, and that is, in its own way, without pushing the, the idea at all, the, the film becomes a, a criticism of, uh, of capitalism, a criticism of uh, the life in America where so much advertising gives us the, the need false need of buying something that we never otherwise would, uh, would purchase. Uh, there's some kind of control in a capitalistic society which uh, we do better without. Uh, I don't know what's better than capitalism, uh, but I don't intend to, uh, to preach uh, my political views. But uh, in, in its own way, spontaneously and is there, therefore that much more authentic and information that you can rely on in making whatever judgment of the system. Well, one more question about cinematography, maybe the hidden or the unknown thing that happened during your work as a cinematographer observing. Does it more like music or literature? More well, light, but let's not forget that it's something of its own. <laughs> it's, uh, there's no script, so, so that sets it apart somewhat from literature. Music is closer, I'd say, to what happens in a documentary, which, which is perhaps an obvious way of saying uh, make a documentary of, of music. And uh, I've made Skinny Shelter, The Beatles, uh, half a dozen films of classical music. Uh, when you see those films, you, you see that uh, music can play a very important part in a documentary. Kind of belongs there, but it belongs there most when it's an inherent part of the of the scene, where where you don't use music to, uh, to, to override the events of the film uh, in order to jazz it up or to give it some kind of energy. Uh, the energy <coughs> should be in the events. And if those events are music. So much the better. But if those events are something apart from music, then let's not uh, introduce something that's going to make it artificial. You may raise your hand. To, how many of you have seen the film here? Yeah, it's, it's too bad all of you haven't seen it. So it's something that, as Israelis, I think, you're very moved by. Or, to put it another way, any human being some sensitivity would be very moved by the journey to Jerusalem and very moved by almost any documentary, whether it's in one language or another, because it brings people who you would never otherwise be close to you. And uh, the possibility of loving that neighbor is enhanced that much more by seeing people close up.
Not necessarily celebrities either. This was a celebrity play. You got to feel very close to all of the members of the orchestra as well. Uh, you speak about, um, you show, you show Leonard Bernstein speak about Israel as a model to the world and a resurrection, great hope. And what is the impression for you now of this model or this great hope from 1967? What happened to this hope or model? Almost, uh, almost dashed. Oh. Almost dashed completely. There's very little hope that I see. But uh, maybe new leaders will arise from the ashes and uh, turn things in another direction. I mean, one problem I see, at least in America, is it's all war, not peace. Uh, you, you turn on television, it's, it's, uh, it's killing. Uh, not making things better, not happiness, or ways to reach happiness. Not love, but disappointment. Uh, we've got to change things so that we have experiences that can make us have new experiences of a different sort. Uh, anybody that's, I don't know, <laughs> you should be asking this question perhaps. I'll ask you to ask it. No, 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 it was excellent. And, uh, <laughs> Said, but it's maybe, maybe someone, do. maybe with all of my preaching about what one can do making a documentary, is, is there somebody here who would like give us a few moments of time telling us of, of a film that that person is in progress with? Somebody want to share with Albert? new project, his documentary project, to tell something about it? Mm -mm. Everybody's so shy. shy. Very. Do you, want? <laughs> you are very shy. <laughs> well, it is a great project. Just in a few words, some, give us an inkling of what the subject matter is and how you're approaching it. You want to say it in Hebrew and I'll try to translate it, Vern? She gave you the, her, her, her radiation film. It called Yuval is waiting for the sunset, for the sunrise. sunrise. For the sunrise. She won, this film won the last talk of the documentary festival in Tel Aviv. And now she continue filming this boy. Please tell more about the, this boy, about the boy in the film. In English, I can? Yes. I can speak English. Yuval is a young boy. He is a young boy. He is a waiting for sunrise. He is about young about uh, four years. Um, I document uh, him. Um, it's about the relationship between him and his mother because he's a boy that his gender is not uh, very clear. And the film may talk about the, the acceptance of his mother and how she chose him over her husband in, in terms of giving a, a space to be uh, what he has to be, what he wants to be, a place with peace, uh, what uh, that he don't get in school or outside that everybody is calling lady. Uh, How old is he? Now he is uh, 12 and a half. And I started to film, film it, uh, him in, when he was 8 years old. I can, I can imagine, you don't have to tell me, I can imagine that you're, you're hoping that with some validity to it, that people will 
will connect with this boy, uh, that they'll, their emotions will engage with him in the situation that he's in. Is that what, what you're striving for? Yes, of course. I want um, people to love him, and maybe they see people like him that they knew, and treat, treat them otherwise, and not in a bad way, uh, but in exceptions. And this is what... Sounds like a, a, sounds like a universal situation. I wish you the best, and it sounds as though you're on the right road. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for sharing it. You know, Vera is a great cinematographer, and her observation is really, really unique. So what you see that she is with the family for a long time, and then and the kid, Yuval, the main, the main character, cannot sleep in the night. He's a young boy, eight, nine years old, he cannot sleep. And he's all the time very disturbed. And then there is a moment, and the camera is there, when he tells the mother, why doesn't why doesn't want to go to the school because everybody call him lady and later you see that he said I want to be a I want to be a girl I don't want to be a boy and it's all filmed with such a sensitivity and then she is continue filming this and see how the mother is accepting and how the father is rejecting and what is happening in this dynamic. I had a childhood experience that uh, it was so personal and so profound an example of love that uh, I would have loved to have filmed it with me back uh, or something like that. So it's kind of an inspiration for me to go ahead continuously. I've been making films now for 50 years and I still haven't done enough yet. When I was a child in the 30s, the custom most prevalent amongst, amongst lower middle class families like my own was to have a strap and if the child misbehaved, then the father would hit the child with a strap, something my father would never do. But there was one occasion when he did. It didn't hurt me. Uh, and But as I walked through the apartment, just after the being hit, I entered his bedroom, and as I looked back, there he was with his head against the wall, crying, and in utter amazement, but in some most dramatic realization of his love, most beautifully expressed in this particular fashion, uh, I just couldn't get away. So finally, I did leave. Uh, to this day, I don't know whether I should have spoken to him about it or not, but certainly, certainly, it certainly 